Daz and Seb, pumped to have you guys here. Welcome into Blue Collar Bitcoin. What a foursome this is, man. Thanks a lot, guys. Welcome, yeah, what you guys are doing is definitely needed in the space. And uh, yeah, we really value what you guys are doing. The same right back at the two of you. We, uh, we're truly enjoying the content you guys are putting together ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Audience, welcome in to Bitcoin Basics. We have had this in the works for a while. Uh, my name is Dan, just for no one that's been in here. I'm joined by co-host Josh, and then we have Daz and Seb from Looking Glass Education. Um, all average blokes, right? We got mountain bike instructor, couple firefighters, electrician, uh, relatable jobs. So, so we've got... Uh, average blokes educating regular folks about Bitcoin, no experts in here. Um, and our goal in this series is just to make a conversational, laid back, fun opportunity for hopefully uh, newcomers or those that have been in the space in a while, whoever you are, to get just kind of some touch points um, on Bitcoin. What is this thing? It's insanely complex. Format is is going to be a roundtable discussion. So we're going to pick a topic each episode. Uh, each of us will go around, give an idea, and then we'll riff on it for a period of time. Meant to be conversational. This is not going to be exhaustive. We're not going to, in however many hours we record, 10 or 15, cover every aspect of this thing. Because it is a rabbit hole deeper than you can imagine if you're new to this space. Today is just an introduction. So we're going to give intros to ourselves, who each of us are how we came into Bitcoin, and then we're just going to wet some whistles, set some hooks, throw out some teasers, hopefully in preparation. We have eight episodes planned. This is episode one. Who knows if we'll do more than that. I'm pumped to be here, guys. Throw in, throw in here any comments or thoughts before we get into the meat and potatoes. Just super pumped to be here, boys, and I think this is so much needed uh, within the space. It's very easy for a lot of us to get lost within the nuance of this deep rabbit hole like you say and we forget about people who are new to the space and need the bare mm -hmm. bone sort of basic understanding of what this thing is because it truly is transformational in my opinion and uh you know it's changed me personally which well, i'm sure we'll get into over the course of the next eight episodes i um, happy to share a lot of that um and yeah i think we just there's so much assumed knowledge within this space so we mm -hmm. just need to really distill a lot of this down into the bare basics and like you say we're just normal blokes trying to understand this thing you know we all each come of it uh, at it from a space of having to put in real work you know um working for wages and to once you sort of tear the lid off and you understand that what we're doing day to day spending time away from our families and our friends and you know what we would prefer to be doing only to be slowly and surely robbed and eroded through, you know, inflation and the like. Uh, it's really quite, like I said, transformational. Once you lift the lid off that and you, you start to realise you've been working for currency um, and, and not sound money, which, again, we'll, we'll, we'll dive right into this and explain all these concepts if it's flying over anybody's head. But, um, yeah, just super pumped to, to be here. Thanks for inviting us and keen to get stuck into this thing. Yeah. Why don't we start with backgrounds? Uh, we'll link down in the show notes if you don't give a shit about our backgrounds and you just want to get straight into the content and us talking about Bitcoin. But for those that want to know more who are potentially going to spend hours with the four of us, uh, let's start with you, Seb. Who are you? How did you come to Bitcoin? For sure. Yeah. So my background, I would say, is ever since like a little kid, I've been obsessed with mountain biking and the outdoors and passing on knowledge and educating. And so that kind of led me down a rabbit hole of mountain bike instructing. And so for a long time, I was a backcountry guide up in the Yukon. Uh, I worked with individuals, teaching them how to jump, how to do tricks, how to stance and braking, simple things like that. And um, from there, it just kind of evolved. And I recognized that one of my favorite things to do is to try and distill down really complex biomechanical movements into their simplest form. But then after a decade of teaching, I started to realize that I wasn't as uh, intellectually stimulated as I hoped I would be. And mm. on my side, or, or one of my side passions was kind of the financial markets, macroeconomics. And I just absolutely loved it. And that's where I got my intellectual stimulus from. And so 
that kind of developed from just being like a side passion to, I wonder how I can start to use my skills in instructing and distilling down complex subjects into their simplest form, but transition that into the finance realm. Because more than anything, I think that if you want to go and understand options or futures or Bitcoin or macroeconomics, whatever it is, there is so much incredible content out there, but it is deep and it is so hard for the average person to understand. And so that is where we, Daz and I, uh, and we'll probably get into it, started Looking Glass because we're trying to speak to the layman. We're trying to speak to the average person who doesn't have that that big depth of jargon so that they can understand this stuff. And we think that is so important. And so my background comes from teaching and trying to distill down complex stuff because I like to be able to speak to the average person who I think benefits most from these the, the world that we're living in if they can understand it. Uh, before we move to the next guy, explain your day job a little more. What are you, what are you up to on a day-to-day -day basis currently aside yeah. from looking glass stuff? A hundred percent. So I used to work after about 10 years of teaching mountain biking, I just destroyed my knees. So even though I'm um, coming on 30, my knees are of an 80 year old. And so I ended up transitioning from teaching to working for a mountain bike manufacturer. And so I worked in systems trying to uh, operate the company and make it as, as efficient as possible. And then from there, we, uh, I realized during the pandemic, I was just like, you know what, is this really uh, what it is that I want to do? Am I really able to share my knowledge and my passion for educating? And uh, so step back just a second, at the end of kind of 2019, I started exploring Bitcoin. And I'd heard about Bitcoin in 2013. I think my brother, my younger brother had talked about it in 2014, 2015. And uh, I was just like, it's a scam. I was a big Warren Buffett fan. Yep. You need intrinsic value. So I was just Such like, I'm never going to touch that thing. And uh, so I ended up, uh, the moment I discovered Bitcoin, I went deep down the rabbit hole. And at the start mm -hmm. of 2020, when the pandemic hit, I was just like, you know what? I'm working from home. This isn't necessarily the job that I want to be doing. And so I quit my job and just went full time into trying to educate. And although at the time and even still now, it's not necessarily providing a wage, I realized that sometimes you have to do things uh, without potential for reward just because you realize that this is needed in society. And I think people need access to this content. And so I quit my day job in, um, I think it was June of 2020. And then since then, I've just been writing content, trying to uh, help others and educate others and so I'm working on Looking Glass at the moment. And then as a side project, I've also started a weekly free newsletter, which is called the Chi of Self-Sovereignty. Uh, and that is all about how, it, like why self-sovereignty is so important because I realized that when I was writing about Bitcoin, like I love Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is so phenomenal and changes everything. But I realized that I had so many other passions that tied into Bitcoin and sovereignty. Yes. And so mm -hmm. by writing a newsletter on sovereignty, I can kind of, talk about whatever it is that, as you say, wet, wets your whistle. I can kind of expand on those things. So uh, the Chief of Self-Sovereignty is my kind of side hustle. And then at the same time, uh, I'm also writing a book at the moment on uh, the incentive structure behind Bitcoin and how it changes or how money changes everything it uh, inhibits or uh, amplifies what it is that we do. And so that's kind of my side hustle at the moment. Got a lot going on. Too that much. a plateful, my friend. That it is. Daz. Yeah. So um, I'm an electrician by trade. Uh, come into this trade late in life, actually. So I um, I was about Seb's age where I was sort of probably, I don't know whether you hit that 30 mark and you all start to, you know, reassess what you're doing with your life. You know, kids started to come into the equation and so forth. And um, so I, I started an electrician's apprenticeship, uh, which is a four-year apprenticeship in Australia um, at the age of 30 and I've been in the industry 10 years now. So uh, I've also um, along that path studied electrical engineering um, at university level but before that I was a salesman. I, I used to sell durries for a living which is um, Australian, you know, Australians always got slang for everything. So cigarettes, I was a cigarette salesman. You know that guy, thank you for smoking. I was pretty yeah. much that guy but not, not as cool, you know, not, not <laughs> lobbying governments but lobbying um, retail um, shops and so forth. So, uh, and it, it's funny, like when I was earning wages, um, I used to work for salary. So it was kind of one of these really, it was a profound moment when I sort of come to the realization and it's probably only later looking back and reflecting on that whole system that I realized how bad it was for my mental health 
the, this whole concept of working for salary. So it didn't matter how much you put in or put out, you got the same, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and when I shifted over to, you know, I sort of come to the realization that I needed to increase my income. I was starting a family, um, you know, wife was, you know, going to stop working for a period of time while the new new baby come out and I, was, I started to sort of panic and I was like, holy shit, what we're doing right now is both of us are working full time and we're living from pay to pay. Yeah. This isn't going to cut the mustard. So how do I, how do I try and leverage my productivity for the benefit of the family? And it boiled down to get off the salary. You have to go out and earn a wage as far as like an hourly rate, you know? So I, um, I was lucky enough to get a, um, an apprenticeship with a public utility and where you are rewarded for your output, you know, the more you put in, if you want to work the overtime, you want to pick up the Saturday shift or, you know, work on your roster day off, then you are duly compensated for that extra output. And it was only through that sort of incentive structure that I started to really, you know, we would put ourselves in a position, you fast forward a few years, get through the apprenticeship, it was pretty grueling, you know, low wage, um, sort of, you know, you you sweep in the shed, you know, you don't get a lot of those opportunities, but I knew, you know, it's sort of that, um, uh, you know, the, the high time preference for versus the low time preference. It's, it's like, if I just knuckle in and I do this four year apprenticeship, the carrots are going to be there at the end of it, you know? Um, and when, when you finally hit that and you are, you know, compensated a good wage. Now I, I did have some savings. I started to, and I never had that before, you know, humble beginnings. I, I, I grew up, um, both my fam, um, my parents, one was a factory worker and the other one worked in the canteen money was, I, I, I grew up with a respect for, for the value of money because uh, we didn't have a lot of it growing up. And, and it was only sort of post that 30 year mark where I actually started having excess income versus, you know, your outgoings that I was like, okay, now what do I do with this thing? You know, so it was at that point I started to look into investing and, and, um, and sort of put my, uh, you know, through those years I was, used to studying i was studying 20 hours a week to get chip away at this engineering degree and there was a pathway for me i was at a fork in a road i could invest another three years and study part-time and finish this engineering degree which would give make me an engineer i'm not an engineer i've done a three year of a four-year course but i was at this fork in the road where i'm like if i continue this engineering degree i'm going to um probably earn maybe have a, a really good job where I, I would enjoy it, but I'd probably earn actually less money than if I stay on the tools, hand on the screwdriver and have those opportunities to really, to really hustle. So, but I, I was used to doing this 20 hours a week of, of study for this engineering degree. So I said, you know what, I'm going to funnel that energy into learning how to invest and all of this excess energy that I'm putting out through productivity, I'll try and turn into an investment strategy and went down that value investment rabbit hole and, this is where we are today. Josh. I uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever heard the saying that you don't really grow a brain until you're 25 years old around about that. I mean, for some people, they never really do. For me, I was fortunate enough, at least I think, to have grown one around 25. So that happened to be right around the time. I don't know what it is. This is kind of like what sparked my consciousness into like maybe political, economic being was Obamacare in, in the United States in 2010. I was kind of pissed about it, how the way, I remember specifically Nancy Pelosi being like, well, we just have to pass it and then we'll read what's in it. You know, like, that's just the way it works. Go fuck yourselves. <laughs> so that sent me down this rabbit hole of basically Austrian economic. So Ron Paul was running for president in 2012. So all of these things kind of coalesced at the same time. So that sent me down this Austrian economics, gold libertarian rabbit hole for a long period of time. And I do remember, and I know it was 2011 because I was thinking about it. I was sitting at this desk at the previous job I had in 2011. And the first time I read about Bitcoin was 2011. And I remember thinking, ha, that's bullshit. That'll never work. And so I get hired at, at uh, this job we have now. We're both firefighters. And I completely forget about all this stuff for like five years because I've never been a firefighter. I was just nose to the grindstone trying to figure this out, trying to keep my job getting through the fire academy, all that stuff. So I just completely disregard most of this stuff for a long period of time. And in 2017, I think I was, so I was listening to Preston Pish on TIP. I probably since about 2015 or so, he had mentioned Bitcoin a couple of times. And then finally in, 
I don't know, it was like July, July, I think it was July of 2017. It finally struck me while I was reading the book Sapiens, both of these things kind of dovetailed together. And I was like, holy shit, this is a really, really big deal. Started deep diving down this rabbit hole in fast succession. And I don't think I could truly say I understood it for about a year after, like really understood it. But I did grok how important this could be if what they're saying is true. And I was an evangelist. I was telling everybody that would listen about it. I was just, I mean, and especially because gold, in my point, in my view, I had a significant amount of money invested in gold since 2010 or so. And I had sold it in order to reinvest it in all kinds of other things. But then I was like, holy shit, this is going to Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, from that point on. And then a bunch of shit coins, which I got involved in as well in the first six months. But I mean, that's a story of just about everybody as well, except for maybe people that got in in 2020 or so. Yeah. Because I think the education was better where like, wh hopefully that the four of us are making it better now so that the people getting in two years from now or whenever don't go down that rabbit hole. But that's all to say, thanks, Preston Pish. Thanks, Andreas Antonopoulos. And, you know, all those people... Uh, VJ as well. The bullish case for Bitcoin, huge for me. That was an awesome article. So uh, that's the quick synopsis of my journey into Bitcoin. And then, you know, 2021, when we started this, it's been fun, man. It's been a great time. Yeah. It has. Uh, before, before I dive in, I, I wanted to say, Josh, I'll come to you too, Seb, here, is um, people take for granted the resources right now. I mean, Looking Glass is one example. Like, even when we got in the space in 2017, it, it looked absolutely nothing like this. Like at that time, the bullish case for Bitcoin was like the first time I kind of saw like a well-articulated, concise thesis about the broad implications of this. I know other stuff existed, but that kind of went mainstream. Uh, the, the the notion of maxis was totally different. Uh, I mean, you were in the middle of the block size wars, but totally different climate. It is the heyday right now, in my opinion, for, for those listening, because it's still so fucking early and there's so much good information. So you can take the shortcut quickly to a phenomenal destination right now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I think we're going to look back on this as the good old days of the opportunity to stack this thing. Seb, were you yeah, going to say something? I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, like, Josh, you touched on something that is just so important, which is. Like for those out there who haven't looked into like Ron Paul or read his book, End the Fed, that a great was one of those moments where that in conjunction with Preston Pish, like I had been a value investor for so long and you see Preston over like a four or five year period, he first like, hey, there's a single Bitcoin. What is a single mm -hmm. Bitcoin? And all of a sudden you see him like get fully orange pilled and go deep down the rabbit hole to the point where he's no longer on the value investing side of the podcast. So he solely does the Bitcoin podcast. And so yep. that is like, if you have time in your day and you want to like see someone who is incredibly intellectual and understands Bitcoin, see their journey through the, the orange pilling process, just go back and start listening to the podcast from three, four years ago where you see Preston slowly go deeper down the rabbit hole. Yeah. It is really, I'd say really phenomenal. It his his when he went fully in i'd say was they, they they still do this but he doesn't do it with them anymore they're mastermind discussions like once a quarter there was one and i don't know exactly when i think it was 2020 uh he was like they were all there i think one guy picked google one guy picked whatever else whatever traditional stock and he's just like bitcoin and um he, he really didn't even have to explain he's just like bitcoin is just my choice in from here in perpetuity I really don't even have to, I don't feel like I need to explain it at this point. He's been on it for so long. And uh, I think he absolutely crushed the other calls, especially, obviously, he picked it in 2020. So, yeah, that was when I was like, damn, Preston is fully on board here, fully. Yeah, I should just add, um, Preston was instrumental in that journey for me too, from the value investing um, mindset. And I went right back, so I found that, um, investors podcast probably I'm gonna say in early 2019 and but I started right at the back catalog because I'm like this, this yeah. is like I heard a couple of episodes I'm like oh, I've got to go right back to the start so I kind of you know on two two times speed just absorbed every single um, you know podcast that those guys had put out barring a few book reviews that I, I wasn't necessarily interested in and so I was able to sort of go on that orange pilling journey along with Preston, I could hear him start to have those really early interviews, you know, from the 2015 catalog right back through the 2017, right up to today. 
and it was kind of, I think I went along that journey with him, uh, with that with that orange peeling moment. I just was able to do it in a, in a faster condensed condensed format time. because it was yeah. out there, you know. So again, just really lucky that we had access to these resources. I would have missed it, you know. Yeah, well, I'll just take a quick and- moment to thank Preston Pish and Absolutely. kiss the ring, and then we'll move on here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over to Dan. Uh, my name is Dan. <laughs> I am a father of two. I'm married. As Josh has already established, we are career firefighter paramedics. Um, unbeknownst to a lot of our audience, our job is 70% medical, like 30% fire for those that think we're saving babies every day. And that's true of most, uh, career firefighters in our area. Um, I went to college. I went to a conservative, uh, Christian liberal arts school. I studied biblical and theological studies and rhetoric communication it was a double major. Dan was um, almost a pastor. My, yeah, I was, I was, uh, in my younger years, seriously considering going into full-time Christian ministry. Needless to say, uh, my life, uh, my language, my subject matter, everything has taken me in a wildly different direction than that. But that does Dan, let me Let me just inject something really quick here, which I didn't know till like the other day at work. Somebody told me, and I'm not going to tell you who, because it'll be funnier when I tell you later, that when they were doing your background to hire you, they were like, we think this guy might be too religious. <laughs> yeah. He could be a scary one. He could be a scary one. I remember yeah. uh when I like my second week, I'm not gonna say his name either, but he came over and he's like, So are you like one of those crazy Christians or uh are you gonna try to convert all of us? And I was like, Brother, you uh, you don't know me whatsoever. Yeah. Um You got a snake in the nest. Anyways, uh I go to college, I played golf in college. Um I started to really question my conservative religious upbringing to a point where I knew that pastoral ministry didn't make sense. That's actually a big part of my story because I think my journey into biblical and theological studies is what really wired me to be a first principle thinker and a skeptic. And that's not saying that if you've concluded those things are legit, that you're not. It's just my own journey really caused me to empty the furniture that I grew up with and then decide what to bring back into the house. And that mirrors my my Bitcoin journey as well in terms of my understanding of finance and economics. So that was instrumental. I, I'm ending college. I Christian ministry is not what I want to do. I love the game of golf. I default into going into the golf business. So I, I became a Class A PGA member over a couple of years. I managed a golf course, taught golf lessons. Great job. Still very fond memories. But my wife and I quickly understood that this was not what we wanted from a work-life balance. And a lot of my passions were really hampered. Like, my favorite thing to do is learn and read and inhale information. And I, and the schedule was just full enough that I had no bandwidth outside of running the business. So for a variety of reasons, one included being that uh, the schedule of a career firefighter is uh, Epic. generous in terms of the amount of time you have to take in information, both on duty and off duty. That shamelessly is part of the, I mean, I love first responding. I love being a medic, but my wife and I also sized up and said, Hey, this is a schedule that's good for our family and good for my passions and hopefully good enough for my skill set, you know? So went into the fire service. That was a long kind of ambitious, ballsy transition, like quit my job with benefits and, you know, decent pay and everything. And, um, we took the plunge, went to paramedic school, you test, you, you test kind of an insane amount when you're trying to become a, a firefighter. You just you know, just keep throwing darts at the wall, hoping something hits the target. Um, got picked up where we work right now. Um, and, ju- I mean, there's a lot of amazing, cool people where we work, but immediately was surprised that Josh was there. Like, I was not expecting to find so much of a kindred spirit. Um, and that's not even just, like, how we view the world, because Josh and I actually have quite different worldviews. We're actually very different people. We overlap a ton, but we have a ton of differences. It's more just his love and passion for learning that impressed the shit out of me. And so we make a connection. Um, He's in that phase that he identified, which was he's just proselytizing the shit out of Bitcoin. I remember where I was sitting when he first explained it to me. And his introduction was well delivered. I immediately knew that the implications of this thing could be significant and the person it was coming from because we'd interacted enough where I was like, this guy didn't just read one book and then spouting off. It's not the first book he read the last five years, right? 
So I kind of go down the rabbit hole in 2017, and then it's been sort of a progression of conviction since then. It was not like I was this go go hung in the beginning, but um, had kind of enough, and maybe we'll talk about this as we get into just the basics of Bitcoin, but had, I think, just enough to kind of get the implications of Bitcoin. Another part of my journey is that I've seen some things from people close to me in my life about how money can really put you in bondage if you don't handle it well. Like, kind of had this understanding that money money is a freedom tool. Um, don't structure your entire life around it, but if you don't have enough of it, uh, you can be really hampered in terms of uh, what you can do uh, as yep. a recreating as a father, the list can go on and on. It can really trap you. So by default through my adult life, one of my passions was finance and economics and feel like I had maybe just enough of that to really get how significant this change could be for humanity. And I have Josh to thank for, for a lot of that. Dude, I, it goes both ways as well because I was kind of in my own world at that point, reading this stuff. There was nobody else I was really bouncing ideas off. Maybe I I thought at one point, I'm like, I'm going crazy. Like, I'm just this conspiracy theorist going down a rabbit hole. Dan actually taking it and taking it serious and getting into it as well was like, all right, maybe because I obviously respect Dan's intellect. And so that helped me as well. Just the fact that you were receptive to it and weren't like, dude, you're you're losing your mind. (laughs) It did help quite a bit. Yeah. And... We'll, we'll start with, we'll get into the, the, the heat of this now. Um, yeah, the two of us are, as I know the two of you are as well, Daz and Seb, we're, we're dead serious about Bitcoin. Um, I think it is quite possibly the most important innovation and discovery that will happen in my lifetime. And I think it's not only, I think it's extremely important for our demographic, for wage earners, for the middle and lower class. I think it's... It, it, for the for the disenfranchised in our financial system, this thing is an unbelievable move forward in the way that our species transfers value across time and space. And that's why we're doing this show. It's for fun, but it's also because we care and we want people to think about this. We don't want you to adopt our views, but we want you to start thinking about this because this is an important enough thing yeah. to spend some hours on. Folks, Swan Bitcoin is the place we point friends, family, and fellow firefighters to buy Bitcoin. Swan is a secure, education-focused, Bitcoin-only on-ramp fit for novices all the way up to full-time financial professionals. Swan's exceedingly easy-to-use interface enables you to dollar-cost average daily, weekly, or monthly, as well as conduct instant smash buys. Withdrawals to cold storage are completely free and can be totally automated. Swan wants you to hold your own private keys. And support is one click or phone call away if you need help in that process. Additionally, check out Swan Premium. This gives members exclusive Bitcoin educational content, discounts on Bitcoin products and services, and privileged access to Swan events. Normally $20 a month, you can get Swan Premium for free for the first year at swan.com slash premium. And it's free for firefighters at swan.com slash fire. All Swan services can be found at swan.com. Blue Collar Bitcoin is brought to you by CrowdHealth. With open enrollment upon us, what if you didn't have to pay healthcare premiums anymore? What if you could invest in Bitcoin instead? With CrowdHealth, you can put aside money for health expenses in your own account and even hold a large part of it in Bitcoin. If Bitcoin goes up, you get the upside, not big insurance companies. Pay one low monthly total to fund an account that is yours. Choose your doctors and hold up to 75% of the funds in Bitcoin. If a large expense comes up, CrowdHealth will crowdfund the bill and pay it quickly. Stop supporting the broken health insurance system with your hard-earned capital. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use code BLUE now and experience freedom from health insurance by utilizing Bitcoin. Right now, through the end of the year, you can get your first six months for just $99 per month. Don't get stuck in a bad insurance plan again. Instead, go to joincrowdhealth.com and use code BLUE to sign up. That's joincrowdhealth.com, promo code BLUE. CrowdHealth is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for health care. Terms and conditions may apply. The Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast is powered by arguably the most legendary company in Bitcoin, CoinKite. Use promo code BCB for 5% off select purchases, including the cold card, at coinkite.com. Established block 141,000, CoinKite is an industry leader in security and hardware manufacturing. 
They are producers of the renowned Cold Card, the world's most trusted and secure Bitcoin signing device or hardware wallet. It's built with a plethora of features fit for Bitcoin beginners all the way up to the most advanced of users. This device is a one-stop shop for your Bitcoin custody needs. CoinKite also manufactures the Block Lock, a gorgeous e-ink digital art display piece sitting in the background of every serious Bitcoiner on planet Earth. Block Clock can be programmed to scroll through key Bitcoin metrics including price, hash rate, the next halving date, and much more. CoinKite are also the makers of the Open Dime, a small USB stick that allows you to spend Bitcoin like a dollar bill, passing it along multiple times. Check out CoinKite's entire suite of products at CoinKite.com. That's an important point, too. Like, when you go look at some other bullshit shitcoins website, XRP, I'm going to beat on, which we always do, you're going to just see them espouse a whole bunch of bullet points that tell you, this is why it's great. This is, And they're not going to point you to books about it. There's no one that's written a book about XRP <laughs> that I'm aware of. Because everybody, <laughs> I mean, I don't think most people that are that interested in XRP are capable of writing a book. So there's a very different rabbit hole available for learning about Bitcoin because there's people that are very thoughtful, very intelligent, very thorough that are vetting this thing and then getting so inspired by it that they write things about how Bitcoin is mycelium, <laughs> you know, or, you know, anything by Gigi. Like this stuff is hugely awe-inspiring when you read it. And I'm just jealous of his ability to put that stuff on paper. But yeah. um, I digress. Let's get into this thing, boys. Um, Seb, Seb, let's start yeah. with you. Topic, we don't know what it is. Get the round table going, brother. So I would say, and you touched on it just then, which is the fact that like this may be one of the greatest innovations that we have had to date. Because in, in short, basically what we've done is we've separated money from state. We've separated money from the issuer. And what people will find as they go deeper down this rabbit hole is that what that does is realign incentives. And so this is kind of what, what I'm going to focus on for uh, my little thing that I, I recognize is the most important thing about Bitcoin, which is it realigns incentives. And so I'll, I'll give mm -hmm. two examples for that. So first, because Bitcoin, you can store it in your head, uh, whereas most other wealth is very centralizing or it needs, to be, it needs to be physically stored. What happens is it's easy to steal and it's easy to take. That means yep. that you create a world where the best way to obtain capital, the best way to obtain wealth is to like use force or coercive force to obtain it. Whereas in the Bitcoin world, what ends up happening is because the only way to obtain capital, because someone is storing this value in their head rather than physically, is to offer value. And so all of a sudden you've realigned those incentives. Rather than using force and coercion to obtain something, you use value and value creation and collaboration to obtain value, which I think is truly, truly amazing. And then the second one that I'll uh, kind of touch on, which is when we have a system right now that is built on growth and debt, and we will talk about this throughout this presentation, or throughout this podcast series, when we have a system that is built on growth and debt, our monetary policy has to continue devaluing the currency in order to be able to continue to survive. And what that means is it does not incentivize you to save. It incentivizes you to consume. Whereas what yes. Bitcoin does, when you have something that there's only a finite supply all of a sudden, that means that as the world grows and productive capacity increases, that means our purchasing power increases, which means over time, it's actually incentivizing us to save. And so the implications of this are so incredible. And so going back to kind of the start, I think what Bitcoin does is realign incentives. It incentivizes us to collaborate. It incentivizes us to create value. It incentivizes us to kind of do what's best in society rather than try to just survive and try to overpower and try to extract. And I think that is truly, as you say, uh, Dan, it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's one of those technologies that's going to change the way the world operates. It's going to change the way that people yeah. interact. And it's truly, truly mind blowing. I, two yes. things I right off the bat, I want to comment on what you just said. Number one, this, this realigns the entire concept of violence. And I think, um, Oh, what's his name? Lowry. Jason Lowry yeah. loves to talk about this. Although I don't think I necessarily agree with his point of view. It's still interesting. But the fact that you can't just coerce people violently, it could, it could, the caveat this with that, this could change the way that wars are waged in the future. It could change the way that people interact with each other in a manner of violence. It's just, it's that big of a deal. It really could affect change in that way. And the other thing that you talked about was, this deflationary idea. And I want to mention Jeff Booth's book on this topic, because that is a really, really good synopsis of that whole idea encapsulated. But 
this could be te- this could also be potentially a way to reduce waste in the world because we're not just buying the next thing because it's the next thing you know there's actual it, it it does give us a path forward in being more environmentally conscious like as an incentive structure not just as like oh we're all worried about the environment because we all say that we're woke and that's what we do but we do it yeah. because it makes economic sense which is the way you want to incentivize people in general you don't necessarily you'll never win a battle by giving people an option of losing you win a battle by giving people the option of winning and making the winning good for everybody it's a win-win situations that we want to perpetuate all the way down mm. Mm. um and uh, that that dovetails exactly when when we sort of pose that question um before we joined like what, what what does Bitcoin mean for you? They were the the same things echoed on on, on my notes here was incentives, um, and introducing a deflationary what what becomes deflationary currency. And I might just take a little minute to explain that for newcomers why ultimately Bitcoin will be deflationary because it has a fixed cap supply. So it's built into the rules of the of the protocol. Um, which is enforced by all the participants in the network that there is a fixed cap of 21 million of these things. Um, at the moment, there's a little over 19 million in circulation and there's a very slow, predictable supply schedule in order to be able to, um, uh, you know, a predictable supply schedule release of every 10 minutes, a block gets released within that block is uh, a block reward, um, which is new issuance of supply until we reach this cap of 21 million Bitcoin. And that's expected to be around the year 2140. Now, why that's important is ultimately it becomes deflationary because people will lose their keys. There's already been instances and well-known documented uh, events where people have, you know, dropped, t- lost 10,000 Bitcoin on a laptop in landfill, you know. Um, what a shame. So ultimately over time, once we hit that 21 million supply cap um, of new issuance, then over time it will be slowly but surely deflationary as in um, reduce supply. Now, why that's important is in a world of finite resources, you know, having an inflationary currency where we can just print more out of thin air to chase the same amount of finite resources results in higher prices. And that's the ultimate basis of inflation. Now, when we all go out and we work for wages and we're slaving away, swapping our blood, sweat and tears for for the, the currency that we earn each week to pay for our groceries, if there's an entity that can just introduce more units, more currency, then we're chasing the same amount of finite resources. So, you know, you could argue that there's new technology and new things that get introduced for us to consume um, to, to increase the amount of, of resources that they are. But the, the real finite resources, the real things that do work on this planet as far as give us nutrition and give us energy, um, burning fuels and so forth, they are finite and they are, you know, ultimately we, we can't produce more of them from thin air. That's what made gold so valuable as a monetary good throughout all of the history and all of millennia was the fact that nobody figured out how to create it. Um, so it's been the sound monetary good for 5,000 years. And when, but it doesn't work in a world where we're globalized and we need to interact with countries and we need to, you know, with you and I, we're all sitting at four corners of the world right now and we're talking freely over a medium. Um, you know, that we're not paying anything for this. It's, it's, it's mind blowing the advances that humanity has made, you know, mm. in, in technology, but we don't have a way to extract all well, prior to Bitcoin. We never had a way to extract value quickly over, right. over a medium. And that's what introduced out of convenience more than anything else, a way for us to do that. And, but the, the, the major flaw with that is the fact that it's centrally controlled and it, that, monetary supply can be inflated and more units introduced at will, which ultimately erodes the purchasing power of people who are out there doing the real work, you know? Yeah. It, it, yeah. Sorry. I, I saw you had your um, hand up there, Dan. I skipped over you. No, uh, keep teeing off. I was going to hop back in because the word protocol has been used a couple hey, times. 
No, you sorry. want to say something, Josh? I do want to just inject something before it's too late with Daz. Daz, Daz, you're in Australia right now. And just on the topic of what you were saying, if I wanted to send you 100 bucks because I owed you money, $100 American, I don't even know how I would begin to do that at this moment. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know how I would yeah. do it. I'd have to go into a branch and you'd probably get the money two weeks from now if you were lucky. Yeah. And it probably would get stopped somewhere. Right now, the two of us, I could send you a lightning payment for that equivalent amount of money in one second. You would receive the I'll money. Spin up an have, invoice. Yeah, exactly. You would you would have the money instantly and it'd be final settlement. I could never get it back. And that is what we're talking about here. You know, there's no borders for this. Yeah. What uh to use what you just said to parlay into talking about a protocol, our current monetary system is massively antiquated. Right, the, the the system where you it feels digital, right? When you look at your bank account, it feels digital, but it's an analog form of money that we've moved to the digital realm. And for that reason, there's an enormous amount of friction. What I just said is a statement that's hard to kind of get if you don't understand the inner workings and the layers of our financial system. But we have a pre-digital form of money that we've patched to work in the digital realm. And what Bitcoin purports to do is upgrade money so that it is natively digital, okay? As we define the word protocol, and I'm just going to pull up some some old notes of mine I have here as a reference point, because at, at its most fundamental, most of us have our usage of the internet and of computers, and our involvement in the digital realm has way outpaced our understanding of how it works. So there are probably people listening that literally don't know what a protocol is, and that's fine. We've all been there before. Essentially, what a, what a protocol is, is it's a set of rules for moving packets of information digitally across the Internet. So uh, put another way, there are sets of instructions that participating devices, i.e. computers, on a network agree to such that they can communicate data and information. We use this shit all day, every day, right? From streaming videos to sending texts to email to tweeting, m much of our lives are yeah. are built on top of protocols. To HTTP, make it, SMTP, the list could go on. Go ahead, Josh. To make it really make simple, it really and I'll be quick so Seb can jump in here. Um, basically, think about it like a language. We have to speak the same language to communicate to each other. If we don't speak English, then the person speaking Chinese is not going to receive the messages. So English speaking is a protocol. Chinese is a protocol. So that it's as simple as that. These are just computer networks who have a standard protocol in order to communicate with each other. And, yep. um, and yeah. Bitcoin is a protocol. <laughs> okay, just a, Bitcoin's a protocol running mostly on the internet with a network of computers. Those computers that are part of the Bitcoin network are nodes. We'll get into that. Um, so you could say just like SMTP, the simple mail transfer protocol is a protocol that's purpose is sending email messages. Uh, Bitcoin is positioned and functions as a protocol to move value across time and space. Go ahead, Des. I think Seb had his hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to add one more thing, which is the fact that you touched on it very, very quickly, which is our traditional monetary system is just this patchwork of fixes trying to alleviate issues. And I think that this stems from how our system functions. And again, going back to that like realigning of incentives, when we have a system, which as we mentioned, is slowly deteriorating in purchasing power, which means we're creating greater and greater, greater wealth inequality, what ends up happening is people vote to alleviate pain. They don't vote for the long-term benefit of society, the long-term benefit of value creation. And so what ends up happening is not only does it corrupt the money whereby we have this system where we're always trying to alleviate pain, but even on a political level, if the majority of the populace in society are like basically having to sacrifice their time and energy at further and further expense just to get by, they're always going to vote for that person who is going to help alleviate that pain. So we end up getting deeper and deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. But by separating that money in from state, all of a sudden, those people in positions of power, those political individuals, rather than just trying to alter behavior by changing the money, they therefore have to create value because all of a sudden money is out of their hands. So now they have to create value with a long-term focus. And I think that is so incredibly important when it comes to like realigning values. Yeah. And just to bring it back to, to, to wage earners as well, Seb, is that 
that fact that, like, if you're working your ass off for 40, 60 hours a week and you can save all you've got left at the end of the week is 20 bucks, there's no incentive there in an in, in a inflationary currency world where you're losing purchasing power. There's no incentive to stack that away because each day that you hold that, while it's minute and you can't see it from a day-to-day perspective, a year-to-year perspective, you definitely can. That $20 didn't buy you what it bought you the same time 12 months ago. So there's no incentive there for you to save that or do anything productive with that excess cash that you have. Therefore, yeah. you're just going to go and buy another carton of beer or another six pack of beer. You can't get a carton yeah. of beer for 20 bucks anymore. It's a six pack of beer to give you a buzz because it's productive. That's that's what it's doing to you. Whereas if you change your um, perception on, if you're saving in a monetary good that increases in purchasing power over a long term, man, your incentive, your whole way of looking at your life changes. It pivots. It's what can yeah. I do? How can I hustle? How can I pick up that extra shift? Because I know if I work, you know, I'm working tomorrow, uh, uh, Sunday for me. Sundays, I hate working Sundays, but financially it's worth my time to do it because I know I'm going to be able to stack more sats, which is a denomination of Bitcoin. You know, I know I can't, that Saturday is not going to buy me a whole Bitcoin, but it buys me a stack of sats, right? So my whole yep. incentive structure um, you know, obviously weigh out what's worth my time, spending time with your family or whatever, but at least it's in within my power to make that decision then. And that if I, if I choose to do that, then I know I'm going to, but from a long-term time horizon, it's definitely worth my time to, to go and invest that time now, um, hustle and stack, and then you know, change all my behaviors from my consumption patterns to what am I eating, how many times we eat out per week, you know, it makes you re-evaluate how you're spending your time, your energy, what money you're spending um, on a day-to-day basis, how you can be a bit more thrifty, how you can look at your overheads from who's dipping their hand in your pocket, you know, I went from four subscriptions down to one. You know, you, you got your Netflix and your binges and all of these other ones, whichever ones you guys have got in, in, in your uh, jurisdiction. Yep. But, um, you know, I'm sitting there, we had all these subscriptions. I'm like, why are we doing this? We don't even watch that much TV. One's fine, you know. One mm-hmm. one will be enough for the kids and the wife and everything to, to, to be up. So you just go through everything that, you know, you're just incentivized to find more thrift in your yep. life. Yeah. Because you know you can save in a protocol that's going to increase in purchasing power over time. What's really important to highlight, I guess, and we'll get to this in this series, is is that volatility. You've got to iron out that volatility, and we can talk about strategies and so forth, but it's really important to highlight. We get it. Anyone who's new listening in, you go, how can you seriously be talking about a savings protocol when the price goes from $60,000 down to $16,000? What we're advocating for is a very long-term time horizon when you look at this thing. Um, and I, I guess, are we happy to just touch on that DCA strategy straight away, guys, or do you want to save that for another day? Uh, I just Actually, you said something I wanted to uh, comment on really quick. Just on the idea of capital accumulation, there's a lot of people, I think, that almost demonize that idea. Like the Scrooge mm-hmm. McDuck idea people have in their heads of these rich people trying to steal or not steal, but trying to get as much money as they can just so they can, you know, go swim in it or something. Capital accumulation is the backbone of everything. When you save money and you reinvest it into the stock market, your favorite company, a company you think is going to grow, that money is now being used in a productive way to make society better. When you take that, say $20 you have at the end of the month or end of the week, and you piss it away on something stupid, the money is squandered. You take it and reinvest it in, say, Apple or you know, a productive company, the money's now going to work in order to produce things that the world wants. And this is again back to incentive systems. Like capital is an incentive to make the world work and make the world a better place. Whereas squandering it on, you know, stupid, frivolous stuff is just pissing it away and it's a net negative for the world. So this mindset of going from uh, you know, Basically, this poor mindset of throwing the money away because it's worthless versus reinvesting it because you have this, you have a longer term point of view where you want to make yourself richer in the future and you want to, and you're also bettering the world in a meaningful way by capital accumulation. 
So I just want to make sure that that's a well understood point because that's the mindset shift that Bitcoin, the idea that we have is that Bitcoin changes the way money is viewed from something that's a throwaway trash item, basically, to something that is valuable, valuable. and something you want to hold on to in perpetuity. And it's well, definitely yeah. done that for me, man. I have saved more money since wanting to get on a, you know, since understanding Bitcoin than I probably for the previous 30 something years of my life. And I think you bring up such a good point, Josh, which is, I think a lot of us believe that our values and our beliefs come from whether it's our genetics, whether it's our parents, but the reality is that they're from our environment. And so if money, which is like the most foundational part of our environment, everything is downstream of money. If that is corrupted, it's going to impact how we save, just as you say, yeah. Josh, our values, how we give back to society. So I think that it's about changing this mindset to believe that actually, you know what, if we can fix the money, it can alter many, many areas of the economy. And actually, I would argue near every area of the economy because everything yeah. is downstream of money. Yeah, it's oh, all incentive. Point, man. Man. Money is the carrot. You know, if the carrot is corrupted, you're not going to chase the meaningful capital accumulation. It can be argued that it is the most fundamental form of human language. Yeah. And like you said, if you, if you take pretty much everything in your life and trace it back, money's involved somehow, right? The food you eat, your children, what you do for work, what you do recreating. I mean, it's it's like you said, Josh, there is in some people's and this is more of like a religious thought. But in a lot of like religious context, there is the like escape the worldly, get away from money, which I understand. Like you shouldn't be beholden and, and in bondage to an obsession with growing wealthy. Like that's probably not the healthiest thing to do. But that's not to say that you shouldn't be conscientious and preoccupied and driven to uh, feather a nest that's appropriate for you and your offspring. And at the core of that is money. And we're going to suggest in this series that the best feathers and twigs and mud to, to create that nest uh, <laughs> include quite a bit of Bitcoin. Daz, go ahead. It's important to remember our grandparents had it right. You know, all of our grandparents, I, I think I can speak for, for everyone here, where they were big advocates of saving money. But the really fundamental difference was money was money back when they knew it as money. And it's only since 1971 that we've been on what's, and we'll expand on this to explain exactly what we're talking about in, in, in later episodes. But fiat currency is the standard that we're on now, which, as we've spoken about at length, can be printed out of thin air. Prior to 1971, money was gold-backed, largely, uh, with periods of, of skipping in and out. But that's what your grandparents knew. So that, that, that's the values that they instilled in us. And yep. we've grown up in a world where currency loses purchasing power. And like, even though we might not have been conscious of that, subconsciously, we are aware of it. And we have been built up, up in this financial system that's being developed and evolved around this fiat monetary system with that basal knowledge, unconscious knowledge that your currency and your money is losing purchasing power. So we're actually pushed into riskier assets as we go, because we're looking for a, if we do have excess, um, uh, excess value from, from our productivity, we've, we, we can't park it in a bank because fundamentally, I think, you know, as, as human beings, we consciously knew that it wasn't working. <laughs> so we've been, you know, and the, and the whole financial system has been uh, developed around this, like I said before, pushing us into riskier and riskier assets. So equities are one of the most riskiest assets you can, you, you, you can invest in because you are, you know, often third or fourth in line if, a, if, if something was to go insolvent in, in order to get your money back. Um, but that is what has been, sort of touted as the best place to put your money for the last decades. You know, uh, it's, it's, you know, if you're not investing in stocks, that is the only form of investing I knew about, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I, I didn't know there were other options. So, and it's only because the, the, the fundamental currency, the, for the fundamental input and interest rates, uh, are so heavily manipulated. That's the fundamental, um, input into the variables when we talk about asset valuation, which again, we'll expand on at, at length. Yeah. The money Good that point. people are paid in is not a form of money. It is not a monetary technology that they are, uh, it's advisable that they save in. 
And that is a freaking problem because that pushes people then to, as you've alluded to, quote unquote, invest. And the investment landscape and the financial landscape is so incredibly complex. The vast majority of people, especially in our demographic and below, have no fucking clue how to even start it, right? So as Saifedean Amusa said, you have to earn your money twice. You have to earn it for be- being a fireman or a sparky or a mountain bike instructor or whatever. And then you've got to go basically earn it again by either keeping or growing its purchasing power. And that proposition is insanely complex. We're here to suggest through this series that, that Bitcoin is a great monetary decomplexifier is the way we put it here. It's, it's a simplification of the way that you can save money on a long enough time frame. You were kind of getting at this earlier, Daz, because there's someone that's thinking, oh, this thing cut off 70%. We're suggesting that it's built, this protocol is built with a set of rules and a game theory behind it that over a long enough time period is going to allow you to kind of have a one-stop shop for where you park money and it will maintain or grow its purchasing power over time. And that is extremely significant for your life and for the functioning of society. And while yep. Bitcoin can seem complex now for newcomers, what we've found, you know, each of us here, by really studying and spending a lot of time into what this thing is and how it works, I would argue it's going to become one of the simplest investment vehicles for the average Joe out there because it's so, once you understand it and you really grok it, you buy and you hold it and you put it into cold storage, which we'll explain. Um, you, you self custody this thing, you remove all the counterparty risk. It mm-hmm. is one of the easiest investment things. You don't have to think about it. Whereas if you're, put your whole 401k into the stock market. How have you done that? Have you done it through a passive investment vehicle where you know you, you don't have your finger on the pulse of what's going on under those underlying assets? Like I don't know too many investors, like personal retail investors who are reading the the uh, all the disclosures from the from the companies that they invest in, you know? And right. we've also built up this this mentality around investing in passive passive flows. You won't beat a passive portfolio. Whereas there's a lot of macro and financial commentators in the, in, you know, within, within the broader financial realm at the moment who are very much warning. Those days are gone. So, you know, we are at such a precipice, such an important point in economic and financial history that the average day person it's not going to sit, it's not that they don't have the time or inclination to go and digging through and finding the diamonds in the rough from a traditional fo- value investing standpoint. You know, they're not going to be able to troll through the balance sheets and find where potential um, financial fraud is sitting on, on these companies. This yep. is one of the most fundamental tools and um, it's an impairing tool for people to take control of their own personal investing moving forward is really understanding this, this fundamental, um, you know, understanding yeah. Bitcoin and its fundamentals and, and putting that power back into the individual's, uh, you know, ability to invest for themselves. Well said. Um, Who wants I'll, to feed the next carcass here? To the I was hyenas. just going to say, I'll, uh, I'll step up to the plate and give it a shot. So I, I was thinking about how best to approach this and, so I mentioned, I think before we started, maybe it was during this, that recently I've been kind of texting back and forth with a, an older gentleman trying to explain this to him. And I thought, what better way to explain this quickly than to just kind of synopsis or give a synopsis of that explanation I gave him. So here goes real quick. It's the easiest way to help someone uh, new into Bitcoin espouse these ideas is basically to compare it to gold in my view. And I think this is important that, A, this person has to have some basic understanding of finance to grok this that way and then understand gold to a degree. So like gold, Bitcoin has all these qualities of money. Fungibility, which is to be replaced by an identical item. So gold for any other you know weight of gold is the same. Durability, um, and Bitcoin, I would say, beats gold in durability. Portability, so easy to move from one place to another. Divisibility, scarcity. Verifiability, which Bitcoin crushes gold in because you can verify it yourself with your node. And we'll get into what a node is later. It's basically a computer that assists in the Bitcoin's decentralized network, running your own computer that verifies everything yourself. Immutability, and then the history where gold just crushes Bitcoin, obviously. It's 5,000 years old since we've been using using it as money. So with, with the majority of these qualities, Bitcoin is superior to gold, I'd say. 
there's maybe one, maybe two where gold's got an advantage. The other important part to impart, important point to impart is that many will say this is all just made up money in general. Bitcoin is just a made up thing. And you can say that for all forms of money, dollars are just made up. They have value because we collectively believe they have value. Mm. And the reason gold has value is because we believe it does. It's just a shiny, rare rock in any real meaningful way. So to answer that question, it's simple and complicated. The ability humans have to cooperate collectively rests on their ability to share imaginary constructs. Countries, corporations, money, all imaginary constructs that allow us to row in the same direction together. Without these imaginary constructs, we're limited to the Dunbar number. And um, that's basically uh, a researcher who said you can't really have a meaningful relationship with more than 150 people. Just you can't know more than you can't deeply know or trust more than 150 people. So that's where we're limited if we can't trust anyone. So money that we all believe in allows us to have trust in people that we wouldn't otherwise know um, outside of our own little purview. So this greases the wheels of commerce, allows the free market to guide people to the most productive work and allows people to specialize and benefit themselves and society maximally. So effectively money is an imaginary construct developed to remove the barriers of trust between strangers and allow, allow these people to work in groups without needing to know or trust each other. And Bitcoin is the best imaginary money humanity has ever invented. We used shells and beads. They were counterfeited, hyperinflated. We used gold and found that because of the immense weight and effort to move it, it inevitably becomes centralized. We used paper and we found that it tends to be abused by those who control the printing press. So in short, Bitcoin improves on the characteristics of gold and paper money. It's finite like gold and easily transportable like paper and or digital fiat currencies, and it settles instantly. So that instant settlement is the biggest part, at least I think on the introduction. This current monetary system is completely, we, we see it settle instantly. When you see Venmo go to somebody, it's there. It's not really there. Somebody else is taking risk in the background in order to put that in your bank account. With Bitcoin, it's a bearer asset that's digital. So when you receive Bitcoin, you actually received Bitcoin. You can't say that at all for any of this other digital money that's out there. So I'm not completely successful with converting this person yet, but that's the basic gist of uh, how I'm how I'm going at converting a boomer. Go, go ahead, Seth. Yeah, I think what you said is so spot on. And I think there's something that's really important to highlight there, which is a lot of people respond with the whole gold thing saying, yeah, but gold is physical, gold is tangible, and that's why gold has value. Or they may respond and say, yeah, but when you look at equities, equities have intrinsic value because they have cash flow. And I think the reality is when you start going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, and when you even just dive a little bit into philosophy, you start to realize something called the subjectivity of value. And that is that value is completely subjective to whoever right. uh, like deems it to have value. And so I think that when it comes to Bitcoin, because Bitcoin trades at a price, it shows it has value. If it did not have value, people would not swap their money to obtain Bitcoin. And so I think that this goes for anything in the world. If someone is willing to purchase it, it has value. And it just and what that value is also may differ between some people. Some people may want that instant settlement. Some people may want that savings vehicle. Some people may want the ability to mine Bitcoin or basically monetize energy directly. And so depending on what you value is going to uh, determine what you find valuable in Bitcoin, and that is so important. And so when people say, well, tell me why Bitcoin is valuable, the reality is that there's subjectivity to it. Like what what, what, that, what do you find valuable in this world? And then you can start to help people along their argument. The cloud is just someone else's computer. Everything you do online is intermediated and permissioned. Your data is not yours. Opt out by running a private server and take back control over your digital life. Until now, running a private server has only been available to the technical and the wealthy. The team at Start9 has developed an operating system called Embassy OS that levels the playing field and makes it possible for everyone else. Run a Bitcoin node, run a Lightning node, and become your own everything. Embassy OS is the distribution platform open source software has been waiting for. You can download Embassy OS for free and install it on your own hardware, or you can buy one of Start9's plug and play devices. 
They build reliable products backed up with incredible customer support. Visit Start9.com. The BCB Podcast is sponsored by Capital Logistics. Capital Logistics is a freight broker connecting truck drivers and shipping partners around North America, a true blue-collar business that supports blue-collar Bitcoin. They specialize in temperature-controlled cargo, efficiently hauling food, supplies, and other freight nationwide for some of America's largest companies. Capital Logistics is a firm believer that people and businesses should be able to save what they earn without having their purchasing power manipulated by the financial system, ravaged by inflation and currency debasement. As early adopters of innovative systems throughout their business, Capital's excess cash flow is put into Bitcoin every month. If you're someone that wants to work with a company that shares blue-collar values and an affinity for Bitcoin, reach out to Capital Logistics today. Find them online at CapitalLogisticsLLC.com. That's CapitalLogisticsLLC.com. And the, the, the gold bugs have had this right. You know, that they've been right for decades. I agree. The problem was gold wasn't better than fiat for a lot of reasons um, that made it convenient. So that, that's pretty much the, the, the only way that fiat is better than gold was the fact that it could be transferred quickly. Um, you could reduce to a large extent a lot of the intermediaries if you needed to, you know, house your gold. It needed to be stored like within a central bank or within uh, the Bank of International Settlements, for example, is a big player in the space. So the, the fiat rails were then very much, you know, your bank then looks after your ledger and they're completely con- uh you know, control their database doesn't have to be shared with anyone else. So while you're introducing probably more intermediaries, it probably wasn't a good way of explaining it. You're, you're reducing how many people have the hand in the in the pie um, when you're just looking at that centralized ledger. The, the, the reason why gold has failed was because in that globalized world, it, you know, it couldn't be transported safely, securely and, and quickly. That's yep. where fiat really got its legs. The difference between Bitcoin and fiat is Bitcoin is better than fiat at doing all of those things because you can send it across the world instantaneously, cheaply, um, you know, with final settlement without intermediaries. So we're completely removing all of those intermediaries who have their finger in the pie yep. altogether. It is me and you extracting value and it is fiercely enforced through energy. So if you want to change that, you have to expend a lot and a lot of energy, so much so that it is out of reach of any government, any corporation, or you know any centralized entity. They can't stop that now. It is too big. They may have been successful in, in the early years of Bitcoin. And again, we're, we're gonna dive right into these topics. And I'm so pumped because there's so many different aspects and I just wanna yep. Blur, blurred out, you know, <laughs> yep. everything in one hit. But um, there's so many aspects to this thing. It just makes it a better money than, than gold. So, again, just to reiterate that point, gold bugs had it right. They just didn't have a better money. Bitcoin think, is a better money. I think the only way I'm going to worry about gold killing Bitcoin here is if somebody invents the teleporters from Star Trek. Then we have something to worry about, boys. <laughs> and like when people so. are yeah. transporting that shit around, we're, uh, we're, we're fucked. <laughs> hey, bef- before I tee off, observation about this conversation wondering if any of you feel the same way i feel like a hungry hound that just walked into a butcher shop like i'm sitting here like i have it's so much i want to say and we all do it's a wonderful thing the four of us could literally probably go for 12 hours i'm gonna I try to gonna. still I, I, we are i'm saying in one <laughs> sitting dude i yeah, can yeah um all right couple thoughts on, on i love what all three of you just explored and josh i appreciate you bringing up this idea because this is kind of the root of first principles about Bitcoin. Interesting kind of history on Josh and I. I think he maybe mentioned it. This book, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, You just because Yuval is not a Bitcoiner or he's a liberal or you may not like him, that's okay. This book really book was had good, a man. significant impact on how we view anthropology and the history of our species. And I think the summary of this book, the thesis of this book, Sapiens, is Everything is made up, okay? And the best made up stuff wins. And Josh, you hinted at this, but over time, when you trend the history of Homo sapien, what has enabled us to be special and unique and dominate this planet is our ability to cooperate at large scale. And that cooperation is enabled by tools and ideologies. Yep. And these modes of cooperation, these tools, these fictions, these ideologies, 
they have changed many times and they will change again. So we've kind of established with money. And I, I just, while you were talking, I looked up a uh, Andreas Antonopoulos quote. Let me find it here. Bear with me. It's good enough to, okay. Here's Andreas Antonopoulos. So why Bitcoin? Bitcoin because the 21st century needs a 21st century system of internet money that is open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, immutable, and permissionless. That is Bitcoin. We're heading into the 21st century with a system of money built in the 16th century and a system of banking and finance built in the early 20th century. Andreas Antonopoulos. Point I'm making, on. money's going to change, folks. This mode of cooperation, this tool has changed and it will change again. And I think the warning I would give is that you cannot put groundbreaking discoveries back in the box. We're going to claim over this series that this is a groundbreaking move forward in how our species transfers value across time and space. Other examples that come to mind, gunpowder, the printing press, the internal combustion en engine, the internet itself. Once these things came to be, they could not be uninvented, whether you like them or not. Whether you like Bitcoin or not, I'm here to suggest it's going nowhere. And you best start to learn how it operates and what it is because yep. it's going to enter your life whether you like it or not. And the earlier it enters, the more it's going to benefit you. I think it'll benefit no matter when it enters your life, but the earlier it does, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, don't push it away. Let it enter you. <laughs> Go ahead, Seb. I know that. I know that. I was just going to say quickly that I think what you touched on is so important, and that is that over time, the species that have been able to survive have been able to see reality as it is. If we do not see reality as it is, then we're going to make our decisions built on a poor foundation. And when it comes to Bitcoin, what is so fascinating when we say, well, money is kind of the root of everything, like everything kind of uh, stems from money. The reason why we say that is if you think about it, what is the most important thing we have? And that is time. Time is truly scarce. In our day, we only have 24 hours. Uh, in our lifetime, we only have whatever it is, the 77 years on average. And so because we only have a certain amount of time, we choose what it is that we value to direct our time towards. Well, the only way to obtain money, ignoring a printing press, the only way to obtain money is to spend time doing something to then get remunerated in money. And so money in an essence is basically the most important data stream we have because it is the data stream showing where people are willing to spend the time, where people are willing to push value. And so we do not want to corrupt that because what that does is allow us to understand, okay, in society, this is valuable because we see money flowing towards this thing. In society, this is not valuable because there's no money flowing towards this thing. So when you corrupt that data stream, which is arguably the most important data stream in society, that is actually detrimental to humanity because we're mm -hmm. building off inaccurate data. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you that market prices are the most important signals in the world. That is how, like when something is in scarce supply, it's price skyrockets. And guess what that tells the market? It tells the market, you better have a damn good reason to buy that thing because it's extremely expensive and you have to expend a lot of resources to get it. And guess what happens? The equilibrium will fall back to middle because a lot of people that don't need that thing won't buy that thing. And then the price will relieve itself back to some kind of norm. So all of these things, like, like I just could go off on this, but politicians talking about price controls, they are absolute clowns. Like to, to, to put price controls on something means that you will make it unavailable. It's either A, you let it get expensive and you allow the market to, to figure it out, or B, you make it unavailable for everybody that needs it. Like there's no middle ground there. That's the only two ways this goes. And that's why somebody, the four of us, celebrate might be an extreme word, but we celebrate crypto contagion rolling downhill. Like it's the Bitcoin price is cut off because tons of bullshit has been liquidated and imploded. And we celebrate that because we want markets to work on their own. Like they, that is the, when contagion spreads and markets get obliterated, that is the clown sifter. Like it, it sifts <laughs> out the, the just total idiocy Idiocy to irresponsibility to just not a good idea. I'm not saying that everybody that founded a, bit, a crypto business that just went belly up is, is a total clown, but we learn. When things are bailed out and reset, that's an artificial prop in the market, and we don't see what's actually there. And this is a big statement, but Bitcoin is so much more fair 
at the foundation and and so unmanipulable that through the whole capital stack and through the whole through all of society i really believe it will bleed into making markets just far more fair and the cost of capital far more realistic through the entire capital stack this is kind of back to preston pish this is like the origin of his interest in the in this is getting once again an accurate price of money if you will yep and, and bitcoin really enables that but when we have centralized forms of money at the behest of policymakers who are voted in on four-year time frames that can increase in the supply of money and change liquidity in the system, we don't get an accurate representation of what actually has value and what doesn't. And we'll, we'll explore more in this series, but Bitcoin purports to fix or improve that, that dynamic. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hey, I've got one thing to bring up before we, you know, we don't have to rush to bring this to an end because this is fun, but Somebody said something on Twitter today about FTX. Just speaking of clowns, Dan, you made this just light up in my head. This guy suggested, and SBF, the fraud himself, said this is a good idea. He said, why doesn't FTX fire back up and create a new FTT token and then bail themselves out with it? Like that, <laughs> it's, like, that is like the crux of how stupid and clownish this entire situation is. Like, you think that you can just create value by creating some new token that will bail all of these people out that got completely annihilated as if that will have any value or substance. Like it's just mind blowing, mind blowing to hear people say shit like that. And this guy's serious. And SPF is like, yeah, I, that's a, that sounds like a good idea to me. Let's do it. Let's, let's get their money back by it robbing somebody ignores, else. It completely ignores natural selection. And that's the problem yeah. is you're, you're perpetuating failure. And for those who are, uneducated in the market, which to be honest is the majority because they're just trying to survive, they don't realize that that company should not even exist in the first place. And then they're, they're sinking their capital into something that is probably just going to consume their capital and collapse. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to see it. Um, should we chum the waters one more time here? Somebody throw something in and the, the sharks will feed on it and then we'll do some closing statements and we'll end this. Uh, anybody with an idea sure. we haven't, um, we haven't explored I'll, yet. Go I'll, ahead, I'll, Des. I'll dovetail off the, the FTX debacle as well. So for those that aren't in the mix, uh, FTX was an exchange and uh, they would create this trading platform um, one, and people would go and put park their, um, their fiat currency in uh, to get exposure to what they thought was some of these crypto tokens and in, in including Bitcoin. But one of the big things to come out of that, which a lot of Bitcoin is suspected, was a lot of these platforms are selling you a claim to Bitcoin, not Bitcoin hmm. itself. So Great it point. Thanks for bringing this up. That this FTX, you know, they had something, in, it was billions of dollars worth of claims to Bitcoin and they had zero Bitcoin on their balance sheet. They owned zero Bitcoin, but they had all of these liabilities. Uh, you know, people thought they owned Bitcoin within these exchanges and it just highlights we're going to go really yep. hammer this home throughout this series is this imp importance of this idea of self-custody. So what that means in a little primer nutshell is that you can take possession of your Bitcoin. You can be the sole responsibility um, for, for the ownership of that Bitcoin. And what that basically means is just managing your keys and your password in order to unlock your ability to spend Bitcoin. So when you buy Bitcoin, there's plenty of exchanges available. Some of them sell Bitcoin and other crypto tokens. Some are just Bitcoin only exchanges. The most important thing to remember is don't leave it on that exchange. I don't care Amen. who they are. And the good exchanges within the space will actively encourage you and provide the resources to teach you how to take self custody of your Bitcoin. And if they aren't, if they're encouraging you to stake it and keep it within their platform, Run. Alarm bell should ring to you and you should just assume straight away they're rehypothecating your Bitcoin, which means they're lending it out again or they're staking it themselves. They're, they're lending it out to other platforms and so forth in order to generate a yield, to generate income for themselves. And if you don't hold your Bitcoin on this self custody idea, whether that's cold storage, hot storage, um, you know, hot wallets, well, again, we'll dive right into it. But if you don't own those keys, assume you own no Bitcoin. Yep. That has um, has been unfortunately found out for by a lot of people recently. And, um, you know, we hope that that perpetuates better, 
better management of their money in the future. Like they actually learn to custody the stuff themselves. And um, hopefully our, none of our listeners got involved in any of that shit because it's really sad. Um, it's really sad to see it happen. Yeah, it, think- it, it is really sad, mate, because there's so much value getting eroded there um, from, from you know, everyday wage earners because they are they see the, this wider crypto market as a way to get ahead, right? Um, they see, you know, and all of these influences on YouTube and so forth are spruiking that, you know, Bitcoin's the old dinosaur. Whereas, you know, throughout this series, we're going to explore why that's, that is absolutely fur- couldn't be further from the truth. And these, you know, 99.9% of these crypto scams are scams. They hmm. are a way to remove you from your value, um, from your time and energy. And if that's okay, if that's your grok, then go for it. You know, it's a free country. It's a free world. Um, we, you know, we actively encourage it. But what we are actively encouraging is that you educate yourself and know the difference between what you're getting yourself into because, uh, you know, we've spent thousands of hours looking at this thing, trying to find out why it fails or why shitcoin X is better than shitcoin Y and so forth. And we're here to tell you that out of all of those hours of study, we found Bitcoin to be the only, the only true, you know, true savior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know, and I think you, you touched on such a good point, which is like, to be factual as well, you'd mentioned that they had zero Bitcoin and the reality they had 1.1 Bitcoin. So I think they had $18,000 <laughs> against $1.4 billion of backing. So basically they had $1.4 billion in liabilities and they had 1.1 Bitcoin backing all of that. And I think that what that what's happening is that's just a repeat of the fractional reserve system that we have in society today. There's only a fraction of those savings and reserves backing such a large number of customer liabilities. And mm-hmm. all that means is that the moment those customers want to withdraw their money, they can't. There's not, there's not enough uh, assets to uh, back those customers withdrawing their, their, their money. And so I think that what Bitcoin does is keeps people honest. Because when you have a system whereby you can request to self-custody, you can take personal ownership of your Bitcoin in your house, all of a sudden, it also means that these companies, if more people request to take ownership of their, their Bitcoin, then these companies are going to slowly over time recognize, hey, I cannot expose myself to the risk of fractionalizing my reserves. I have to be more fiscally responsible. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add as well, through that whole FTX debacle, um, I know zero Bitcoiners who self-custody their Bitcoin who were worried through that whole time because there is absolutely no way that contagion can leak through to my ability to self-custody my Bitcoin aside from, uh, you know, the temporary anomaly, which is the Bitcoin price in US dollars. Yep. I know I was worried I wasn't going to be able to buy as much Bitcoin as I was hoping to <laughs> because I don't have enough cash. I want more. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk in this series about why, Bitcoin is the the world's first digital bearer asset. We've hinted at some of what this means. There are no intermediaries. There are no trusted third parties in Bitcoin. And that's what makes it the world's first digital bearer asset. And to bring this home for someone that's confused on what that means, every other form of money that you possess or pseudo possess digitally, there's somebody in between. There's a trusted third party, stocks, your bank account, your savings account. It can even be argued the equity that you have in your house. Sure, you could go grab your wallet, open it up, pull out some cash. I would call that pseudo bearer because you have the US government, Treasury, Fed uh, as a, a sort of pseudo intermediary behind that physical cash. So, the, so Bitcoin is the discovery of the world's first digital bearer money that you can possess with nobody in between. And, and we're going to explain that's a big statement and we're going to explain how it does that, how it enforces that, how it enables that. But that's a very significant idea. And if that goes over your head, it went over all of our head for a period of time, but it is worth you continuing down the rabbit hole to understand what that statement means. Cause that is at the, that is at the core of this innovation and of this discovery. And I'll also just add to that, Dan, that this this whole idea of, of Bitcoin is very two distinct things which we're going to explore in depth. There's the asset, Bitcoin the asset, and Bitcoin the network. 
if the asset, even if the asset we, we would argue is one of the best assets that you can do and we'll teach you how to, how to, how to deal with that volatility. But even if that is a gut wrenching too of a gut wrenching ordeal for you, you need to understand the, the, the network itself. So the asset, put the asset aside. The asset is what we, tr what we trade and we tether to the US dollar price, right? Well, not trade, but to save over a long time. But the network in and of itself is going to become so fundamentally important in the, in the, in the next couple of years, particularly when you have governments talking about CBDCs, which are central bank digital currencies, where they will have full access to your spending what you're buying, when you're buying it, and full control over when you can and can't use it. And um, I'm sure we're going to treat that subject uh, and give it the, the 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 diligence that it deserves over the over the course of this series to really outline some of the problems. And some people don't have a problem with that. That's fine. I personally don't like the thought of my government having um, the ability to control where and how I spend my money and how I transfer value and what things I'm allowed to purchase. That fundamentally grinds against my gears. Um, so even if the, the again, the, the Bitcoin, the asset isn't important to you, the Bitcoin, the network may be, and I would argue that it's it's worth your time to invest the time to just understand how to use this thing, how to jump into it, how to transfer some value and how to jump out of it. Your government might decide that you are not allowed to eat beef anymore. I love beef. I love steak. I want to know too. how to go, go down to the farmer shake that guy's hand and say, I would like to buy some steak from you. I have no way of transferring value to you other than this medium, which is called Bitcoin. Will you accept it? And, you know, if the world looks ugly enough, um, he will accept it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So um, that that's something that I hope we can really peel the lid off as well, is just explain the differences between those two things. You don't have to marry yep. Bitcoin, um, the, the asset, but you sure as shit need to know how to use it. Fun fact, Des, I... I just need to proclaim to the masses that I also love beef. And my father grew up on a cattle farm and worked in the beef industry for the majority of his career. So I grew up in a beef family and uh, the audience needs to know that. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> it's important. That's awesome. Well, Should we do forward. closing statements here? Uh, each guy kind of go around something you, you feel like you really needed to get in that you didn't. And then we're going to painfully draw this to a close somewhere around an hour and a half so we don't kill any newcomers, uh, hop in there with closing statements. I'll go first. Um, I think I've spoken enough, so I'll keep it short. But, um, you know, we, we jumped around a lot today introducing some ideas, but I hope it was enough to try and wet the whistle of a lot of these people, at least pique the interest on, on this thing, because it does. Bitcoin does touch so many aspects of our lives. You may not need it every day. Um, you may not want to save in it long term, but I guarantee over the next decade, it will come into your life. Um, so the sooner you understand that, the sooner you can integrate it for whatever it means for you, because it does add so many benefits in so many different ways. And um, thanks for having us on. I uh, yeah, really look forward to the next couple of months as we uh, as we jump right into it. As we do. So I'm going you got it, Josh. All cool. right. I, got it, Josh. I think I got most of what I wanted to say in, but I just want to say, if you've listened to us this far, I, we hope you join us for the next ones because the four of us want to be the shaman that guides you down this Bitcoin rabbit hole mushroom trip. And uh, we think we'll do you well. So yeah, I think that's super well said. I think it's, it's one of those things where I didn't really touch on it too much in my introduction, but... Um, like my background has been in finance. I, I like outside of mountain bike, my background has been in finance and I've traded options. I've traded futures. I've gone through value investing, all of these things. And I think that when you're in a world where the money's deteriorating, we are always so focused on, okay, well, how can I support myself and build security for the future? And I think that what you realize in Bitcoin is you initially go into it for the investment vehicle. You're just like, yeah, I'm going to be able to make money. I can potentially make 10, 20, 30, 100 X my money. And that's what draws you in. And then you realize that actually, it's got nothing to do with money and making money. It's more to do with how can we actually realign uh, the world? How can we make this world a better place? And so this is where when we talk about Bitcoin realigns incentives, Bitcoin changes who you are. It is all of us have gone down that journey and we hope to kind of take you guys along that journey over the next uh, handful of episodes. So thanks a lot, Josh and Dan. What you guys are doing is phenomenal and it's awesome to be able to give a voice to all these individuals such as ourselves. Right back at the two of you guys. We love what you guys are up to. Um. 
to close this out, I'm just going to make the statement that Bitcoin is simultaneously startlingly simple and tremendously complex. And when you first get into it, the complexity is probably what's going to hit you. I'm guessing if you knew nothing about Bitcoin going in, you may know even less at this point. You may have more. We may have uh, introduced more questions than answers. That's why we're going to do seven plus more episodes. This has been just the tip today. Let Bitcoin fully enter you uh, <laughs> over, the, over the next seven plus episodes. Um, but every Bitcoiner has been through this journey of, of how hard it is to get your head around this. I mean, even Michael Saylor, one of the one of the smartest people in this space, has said he thinks it takes 40 hours to really begin to grok the implications. So strap in, stay along for the ride, keep asking questions. Um, our DMs, email are open, both at Looking Glass and Blue Collar Bitcoin. And we're I'm, I'm beyond excited to, to keep this going. We'll, we'll, the goal is to do at least one a month. And uh, what a pleasure this was. I feel like we could have gone... Yeah. Two or three times as long. Thanks, Jens. boys. Take wanna, care. Yeah, you want to give them a handoff real quick to the looking glass? Yeah, well, I'll let one of you do that. Seb or Daz, tell people what yeah, you're doing sure. there. And yeah. So you guys can, uh, anyone who's listening who's kind of interested in kind of exploring not just kind of the audio realm, but wants to explore more of the, whether it's reading, whether it's going through courses, those kind of things, we have lookingglasseducation.com, uh, or you can find us on Twitter at lookingglassedu. And uh, yeah, we just create kind of long form content that dives into Bitcoin from the perspective of macroeconomics, financial literacy, and we very much speak to the layman. We very much speak in a non-jargon, easy and concise manner so that anyone is able to jump on board and start to understand this incredible technology. Beautiful. So we've got a macro and finance course at the moment. So it very much just frames up where Bitcoin fits into that landscape. Um, it's a self-paced learning course, but if there are any teachers or anything as well, listening in or motivated uh, community leaders, then we've also built that in into a 19 part lesson curriculum, which is a massive, massive effort, but you will find teachers, materials, activities, slide packs, uh, all freely available to educators out there um, who, who realize what this thing is and, and want to start, you know, teaching some of these concepts within schools or their community groups. So um, jump on and check it out. We will link looking glass down in the show notes, go check it out. As a spoiler, we have another chat scheduled next month, and our topic is going to be monetary history and the rise of Bitcoin. Until next month, gentlemen, thank, thank you. you. Cheers, boys.